Hey guys, so today I'm um, doing vlog number four. So we're just gonna jump right into it. Uh, the first movie I watched was Kill Bill. And uh, in this movie, um, it's sort of, it's a Tarantino film. So um, it's par for the course that it's not gonna be told in chronological order. Cause that's the kind of thing that Tarantino likes to do. So the movie starts off in a wedding or in a church and um, we can assume that it's a wedding and we can assume that the main character is uh, supposed to be getting married or like a wedding rehearsal or something like that. So uh, the movie starts off at a wedding and it starts off with the main character being shot in the head. So um, we fast forward to four years later and the main character who I'll be referring to as the bride, she wakes up from her coma uh, four years later and she basically ha is awakened with a vengeance now you know she's fueled by revenge and she wants to uh get back at her old the 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 clan of, of viper assassins or so, they're called something similar to that she wants to get revenge on them because they tried to kill her so she makes a list of all her old like clan mates and she goes like she makes a list of other names and uh how she wants to kill them so uh obvi like like i said before the movie's not in chronological order so the victims that we see her kill are not in chronological order so the first uh victim that she kills is copperhead and um she goes to her house to kill her and like they they sort of like they talk and stuff it's not only just like straight fighting the entire time like there's um there's dialogue and there's conversation and stuff, but one of the uh, one of the aspects, one of the ritualistic aspects of the movie is shown through here, um, and that's the code of honor that uh, the bride operates under. And um, she was gonna kill Copperhead, but um, she noticed that Copperhead's daughter was watching, so she didn't want to kill Copperhead while her daughter was watching because that's not honorable. So they waited for the daughter to not be present in the battle anymore like to resume fighting because the, they, they had stopped fighting because copperhead was like wait my daughter's coming home from school now um and i don't want her to see this so basically bill has a very strong um code of honor and she respected this like she she went along with it because her code of honor is so strong and after copperhead's daughter wasn't part of the picture anymore she proceeded to kill her but as it turns out copperhead's daughter was actually watching and because Bill operates under a very strict code of like honor and how she does battle and, and things like that, she tells Copperhead's daughter that when she's older, if she still wants revenge on her, she can come out and seek her, just like how the bride went out and, and she seeked revenge against Copperhead. So this sort of um, sets up like a, like a cycle of, of violence and a cycle of death where if Copperhead's daughter wants to take revenge, like, and kill the bride, then she can. And, like, like it's sort of, oh, once she kills the bride, then in the future, whoever wants vengeance against her, like, that's sort of how they operate since they're all assassins. They operate on a, on a code of, like, of, like, fighting. So after Copperhead is killed, we sort of see a flashback of the bride in the hospital where, um, like... It, it, it's from the perspective of like while she's in a coma where Bill is trying to kill her like to silence her Because she's the deadliest woman in the world however um, He calls off the attack last minute because it wouldn't be seen as honorable if he had her killed while she couldn't defend herself She was unconscious. She couldn't even like put up a fight at all. So he called it off because They still they're all a part of the same like they were all a part of the same assassin group So they all sort of operate under the same uh under the same code of honor after this uh after this flashback we see the bride travel to okinawa and she she meets up with hattori hanzo because she wants to uh get a sword from him and hattori hanzo is a legendary uh swords swordsman so the the sword itself the katana that she gets from him is like a piece of, of like myth and ritual it's an aspect of myth and ritual in the film because it holds a sort of mystic uh presence it's like um higher it's like above uh your regular run of the like run of the mill everyday sword it has a special significance and a special place and it's valuable too because in kill bill 2 um 
they offer a ransom of a million dollars for it. So she takes the sword and she travels to uh, Tokyo or Kyoto and she kills Orin with it after they have a big sort of um, like epic final battle. Orin or AKA Cottonmouth is the last victim for Kill Bill Volume 1. So she uses the Hitori Hanzo sword to, to kill him in like it's sort of like a almost like a ceremonial way because the sword that she's using is so um, like valuable and so like revered. Moving on to Kill Bill Volume 2, uh, the, this film also, uh, it's not in chronological order, just like Volume 1, and it starts off with uh, the bride going to kill uh, Bill's brother, uh, who's the snake charmer. However, Bill's brother senses this plot to kill him, and uh, he he's actually launches the first attack against the bride and shoots her in the chest and buries her alive in a coffin. Bill, the only way that Bill is able to escape this, or not Bill, sorry, the main character is able to escape this, is that, um, well, in volume two, we discover that the bride's name is Beatrix. So the only way that Beatrix is able to escape this is she uses her like one inch punch technique to punch out of the, out of the coffin. Then um, after Bill's brother buries Beatrix alive, he calls L Driver and tells her that he killed Beatrix and that he has her Hattori Hanzo sword and if she wants to get it from him, it would cost her a million dollars. So we see here the Hattori Hanzo is a sort of like a symbol for, um, it's like Beatrix's weapon, she's the deadliest woman in the world, and it's a Hattori Hanzo sword, so it has sort of an air of like mysticism to it. So L Driver goes to pay the million dollar ransom on the sword but what Bill's brother doesn't know is that she puts a snake in the suitcase of money that has the million dollars for the sword. And this is ironic because Bill's brother is the snake charmer. So that's how Bill's brother is actually killed. L Driver uh, kills him with a snake hidden in the stash of money. So once Bill's brother is dead, um, Bill's brother hadn't told Bill that he killed or he, he killed Beatrix yet. So L Driver calls Bill and says that she's the one that actually killed Beatrix, but before she can like meet up with Bill and like get a reward or like be congratulated or anything like that, Beatrix is back because she escaped the coffin and she attacks L Driver, and they have a like they have a showdown and uh, L Driver says that the only reason that she killed uh, Bill's brother was because or no, um, what was his name, Pai Mei, he took her eye. And so this enrages Beatrix and she takes her other eye, her left eye. So now she's blind in both eyes and she leaves her there to like bleed out and die. Um, now Beatrix goes to Mexico and um, in Mexico, like her mission is to sort of discover where Bill is. So she accomplishes this and she tracks him down. And when she's finally like gonna confront him to kill him, like to, to fight him and everything, um, Beatrix sees that her daughter is with is with Bill and this is this is a surprise to Beatrix because Beatrix thought that her daughter was dead So she spends time with her daughter like she puts her to bed and stuff because again like the code of honor uh, Dictates that they're not gonna like kill each other or fight each other in front of the children so um, They spend time together Beatrix puts her daughter to bed and then after that, um, Beatrix and Bill start to talk, like they just have a conversation. And they're like talking and like, uh, basically dialogue about how like the entire, uh, how the, like the events of the movies like took place and like all the assassins that were killed and stuff. And then um, finally they, they have a showdown because Beatrix's mission is to kill Bill. Like th that's what she wanted to do ever since she woke up from the coma because it's Bill's fault that she was almost killed. And um, Bill at first puts up a fight, but he then soon accepts his fate after Beatrix uses the five point exploding heart technique because uh, only their master, uh, Pai Mei, knew this technique. And Bill never thought that Pai Mei liked any of them enough to teach them the five point exploding heart technique. So when he discovers that Bill was able to like sort of gain Pai Mei's favor and learn the technique, like she was the only one that he passed the technique on to, he like gave up and accepted his fate because he knew like if she was good enough to, 
to learn the technique from Pai Mei than he had already lost. So he just took his loss in stride. Uh, he, he took five steps and then his heart exploded. And at the end of the movie, uh, Beatrix takes her daughter and they start their new lives together. So um, the, the basically the themes of, of myth and ritual are very similar to volume one of Kill Bill because um, they were originally in like the same movie, like the same four hour movie, but it was cut up into two parts. So um, the code of honor and um, like how they sort of conduct their their fights where they do it with a sort of uh, like like ritualistic honor um, because the ins inspiration for Kill Bill was actually it's sort of like an amalgamation. It's an homage to like Western films, samurai films, karate films. It's sort of like like a mashup of all of those genres of movies, and it's like a, like a love letter to those to those kinds of movies. So all like the fight scenes and um, the way that the assassins carry themselves are all sort of ingrained in the the like Japanese culture of honor and like the Asian culture of of like karate and, and, and things like that. Uh, those sort of themes that are very prevalent in movies like The Karate Kid where it's all about like discipline and honor and like being uh, not like a dirty and not like an underhanded fighter. All of these themes are present in uh, Kill Bill, like volumes one and two. Now, the last film that we had this week was The 36th Chamber of Shaolin. So in this movie, um, we see that the main character has joined a sort of rebellion of sorts against the government. However, this really doesn't end very well at all and the government sort of slaughters everybody. And so in order to gain vengeance against the government, he, tra he travels to a Shaolin temple because he wants to learn Kung Fu so that he can use his um, knowledge and his skills to get revenge um, for all the friends and family that were killed by the government during their protests and during like their rebellion. So he goes up to the to the Shaolin temple and he completes all 35 of the Shaolin temples of Kung Fu in six years, which that in and of itself is um, an aspect of myth and ritual because typically it would take someone much, much, much longer to to do that. But in the case of this movie, it's sort of like a like a chosen one type of deal where he's just extremely gifted in learning Kung Fu. So he's able to clear out the 35 temples in six years. So he, he clears out the 35 temples, but because the government like slaughtered everybody um, six years ago, he wants to establish a 36th temple, a 36th Shaolin temple where everybody can just go and learn like Kung Fu to, for self-defense so that they can use it like in self-defense against the government should the need ever arise again because the government is still like, they're still on their same, um, their same like wave from six years ago where like they wanted to rebel against them because it was sort of a totalitarian situation. So unfortunately, um, like when he, re when he makes the request to the Shaolin monks to do this, they tell him that he can't really do it because it's not like, it's not allowed. It's not how things are supposed to be. But um, they do know that he, he originally joined the Shaolin temples because he wanted to get vengeance against the government so what they do is that they banish him from the temples as a way to dismiss him from like his spiritualistic duties at the temple like his monk duties and he can go and get revenge against the government so in the end um he does end up succeeding and he does end up establishing the 36th temple so that everybody can uh, learn kung fu and um use it to defend themselves against the government and this film there's um, many more, in my opinion, many more aspects of myth and ritual present because um, Buddhism is so like front and center. You know, the entire, the entirety of the movie is fueled through um, like the setting is in a Buddhist, like in a Buddhist temple, in a Shaolin temple. Um, the ritual of going through each of the 35 temples and like completing them, sort of like the belts in karate where you go from a white belt all the way up to a black belt. The, the temple is like a very similar ritual to it. And um, just myth-wise, Buddhism is extremely prevalent. It's like front and center throughout the entire movie. So those are the karate films. I'll see you guys next week for vlog number five.